Now I, I'd like to introduce Martin Klein. Dr. Klein is in the VU Medical Center in the Netherlands. He's a professor of neuropsychology in Amsterdam. He's really been very instrumental in studying the effects of brain tumors on various aspects of neurocognitive function and quality of life. He's, he's done some extremely important work uh, in this area. He's also involved with research on cognitive rehabilitation. This is a field that's beginning to really explode and come into play for our patients uh, postoperatively. So this is critically important. So he currently studies the mechanisms of cognitive deficits, seizures, fatigue, depression in our brain tumor patients and how to prevent uh, treatment related cognitive effects. So Martin, the work you're doing is really, really important. As we get better at extending the length quantity of survival, we're desperately in need of understanding how to improve cognitive functioning postoperatively in particular and post-therapy as well. So Martin, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you for the, those nice words. I think as when treatment progresses, uh, the world, world gets even more complex um, because we can assess at uh, various levels. So we might look at the neuronal activity and translate those neural, neural events to um, nice imaging. But in the end, I, I think what is most important of uh, when you look at cancer treatments and, and uh, post-surgical outcome is that uh, how people deal with a daily life situation. And here's an example of uh, some Dutch firemen who, who thought they did a good job, but uh, when you look closer, uh, they didn't. And that's what usually happens when you do neuropsychological testing at the superficial level, you might not find these patients to be uh, affected, but when you look close enough, you might find some diff difficulty in uh, most patients and even in uh, people working in the hospital. Um, this is a very busy slide I showed because um, I've been asked to talk about the radiation therapy and the chemotherapy on brain functioning, but it's, it's important to realize that um, before we uh, start talking about these treatments, we should realize that the brain tumor itself affects brain functioning and cognitive functioning and a lot of other uh, issues that might be related to the tumor itself. So epilepsy, fatigue, depression, anxiety, uh, treatment of, anti and, and of epilepsy, and uh, of course, other uh, diseases that ultimately affect uh, cognitive outcome. And, uh, when it, we, for instance, we talk about the chemotherapy, it's mainly in high-grade clear glioma patients who had um, uh, the combination of uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy and surgery. And then it's really hard to, to, to say what causes what kind of uh, cognitive deficits. So I will, will mainly be talking about the radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And when we talk about uh, radiation therapy, it's uh, mainly the, uh, the late effects that are, that are of relevance concerning uh, cognition and uh, behavior. And um, initially, it, it was thought to be an issue in the low-grade glioma patients because their survival was better. But nowadays, with um, improved diagnostics, so including molecular diagnosis, diagnostics, we know that some um, patients with uh, higher grade tumors uh, might survive for extended periods. And that means that um, when we can predict uh, so overall survival or progression free survival of those patients, also cognitive outcome becomes relevant and as related to radiation therapy. So what we might see uh, following uh, radiation therapy, this is a nice, uh, well, not so nice scan, but a, an il illustrati illustrative scan to, to show that what happens over time in a period of about eight months, we might see a, a, an increase in white matter injury. And um, this increase is usually associated with a slow continuous drop in brain functioning. Um, looking more closely, we might also find uh, cortical brain atrophy. And depending on the location of the, of the atrophy, um, we might find uh, distinct uh, neurocognitive deficits. Overall, these patients are characterized by um, apathy, neurobehavioral slowing, problems with prime motor control, might also be uh, associated with um, issues uh, concerning the cerebellum. 
And looking at the higher cognitive function, uh, higher cognitive level, we might find problems in uh, executive functioning, so expressed as a uh, lack of mental flexibility, and of most interest, recently, uh, problems in retrieval uh, of, uh, of information stored in long-term memory. Um, this is some, some historical uh, data. I'm, I do not uh, have the intention to be complete and to be uh, broad, but uh, I think this nicely illustrates that when you do um, info, invest a lot of time in research, you might end up with some interesting data. This is a study that st uh, has been published in 2002. 195 low-grade glioma patients, half of them had radiation therapy one to 20 years previously. They had stable disease um, and they were at a mean of six years following uh, diagnosis. Uh, to have an idea of the impact of, uh, of having a brain tumor, we compared these patients with 100 patients with hematological uh, disease, so um, comparable uh, as far as uh, prognosis was concerned. And also we compared these patients with 195 uh, healthy controls. And what we found was um, after an extensive neurocognitive uh, testing battery is that the low-grade glioma patients had lower abilities in all cognitive domains compared with hematological patients and even worse than healthy controls. And that, that, that might not come as a surprise, but we were surprised that they um, also the hematological patients scored lower. So it's not only the impact of the tumor, but also the psychological effect of having a, having a tumor. Um, cognitive disability, um, we only found it to be present in the memory domain and only in patients who had fraction doses, so that's the daily dose you give, uh, fraction doses higher than two grades. And um, finally, uh, we found that uh, the use of anti epileptic drugs was associated with disability, so severe deficits in attentional functioning and executive functioning. And this is what how the um, how the picture looked like when we looked at memory functioning. The red line are the patients with um, uh, radiation of uh, more than two cray. Uh, so they have pro problems in um, retrieving the information when asking it 20 minutes later, they had problems with active uh, retrieval. And even more, they had problems with uh, rec recognizing um, what they had to learn. So that means that actual the storage of information is interfered when you go higher than two cranes. Um, more recently, there's been an increased interest in, in uh, looking at um, the correlation between uh, the hippocampal, uh, hippocampal formation and the radiation dose. And nice, uh, the le left picture showed a nice correlation that between um, the mean hip hippocampal dose and the hippoc hippocampal uh, volume. So there's a decrease in volume when, um, when there's an increase in the, uh, in, the, in the dose of the hippocampal formation. And I think uh, Fina Kondi did a great work on, on trying to preserve um, the hippocampal formation with the idea that if you preserve uh, the hippocampal formation, it saves um, executive functioning. And, um, this is what it usually looks like, um, and the idea is that the hippocampus plays a significant role in radiation-induced dementia, and, and more specifically in the memory disorders. And also, um, it was found that those as low as two can, can cause significant toxicity to the hippocampal uh, formation, and avoidance of that region might help um, um, uh, preventing uh, cognitive uh, deficits. Um, we did a study in um, uh, low-grade glioma patients where the, the question was um, whether patients who received uh, either um, temozolomide or uh, radiation therapy had a um, better survival. This, this, these are the progression-free survival data, and this is the period of one year. And in the period of, uh, period of one year, we didn't see any um, advantage of radiation therapy of temozolomide. But of course, we were wondering whether uh, when you had a direct comparison of uh, radiation therapy compared to chemotherapy, whether there was any uh, deficit in the memory functioning. Uh, so we had 98 patients, a, a subsample of the total population. Uh, compliance dropped uh, below 66% uh, after 12 months. So the analysis was 
at baseline six months and 12 months. And at baseline, there was no difference in memory functioning important in gender, age, or educational levels. And those are factors that might explain memory differences, but we didn't find any differences at, at baseline. Uh, what we found was um, at 12 months, um, the things are a bit difficult to see. At 12 months, we did, didn't see any difference in memory functioning between the radiation arm and the temozolomide arm. But however, when we looked at the delayed recall, so the, the amount of information you, you asked to recall after 20 minutes, we saw a drop in uh, patients who had, um, who had radiation therapy at six months. But at 12 months, they recovered again. And this indicates that there might be a, an early effect of radiation therapy, but in the longer term, we don't find any evidence of um, a memory decline. We now plan to go back to these patients and see whether uh, patients who have uh, been tested for, for prolonged periods after radiation therapy uh, might have uh, these deficits. Um, I showed you previously in 2002, we looked at uh, 195 patients. Um, in 2009, we published on uh, 65 patients who were still alive and stable. Half of them had uh, radiation therapy and only three of them had fraction doses higher than two grade. Uh, they had to have stable disease. And this was a mean of 12 years after di a diagnosis and a huge range of six to 28 years. And we compared these patients with uh, 65 controls. And what we found is that Patients with, ra with radiation therapy had attentional problems, executive problems, uh, problems with information processing speed at 12 years, and that was regardless of the fraction dose. And also we found that um, attentional functioning dropped between six and, and 12 years. And uh, that was happening in, in patients with radiation therapy. And when you compare the groups, we, we found that patients with radiation therapy, about 53% had uh, cognitive disability whereas 27% of patients without radiation therapy could be characterized as cognitively um, disabled. Uh, interesting, interestingly, uh, concerning memory, we didn't, didn't find any evidence, evidence that on the longer term, so between six years and 12 years, there's a drop in uh, memory functioning. And actually, all, all patient groups, so the irradiated patients and the once without radiation therapy got, uh, got better and uh, their performance was around the zero scale, so comparable to healthy uh, controls. Uh, in 2019, uh, we could still uh, trace uh, 33 patients, um, so 14 with radiation therapy and all had um, radiation doses less than two grays, so the one, ones higher, they dropped out of the study. And they were alive with some, uh, some patients with recurrence, and this is at the mean of 26 years after diagnosis. And uh, at that point in time, we didn't find any differences in the clinical uh, characteristics, and we compared these patients with healthy controls. And what I'm showing you now are the, are the plots of the 6, 12, and 26-year follow-up. We see that um, there's a slight drop in um, executive functioning, psychomotor functioning, is, there's no difference. Verbal, verbal memory, no difference at all. Working memory, hardly any difference. Probably um, the irradiated patients perform a bit worse. Information processing, uh, there's no effect. But we found an, an uh, radiation by time effects indicating that in between the 12 years and the, and the 26 year follow up, there's a drop in patients who had radiation therapy. And um, we can discuss whether this drop is, uh, is still within the 1.0 uh, minus one standard deviation, whether this drop is clinically uh, relevant. So the conclusion would be that um, in a very long term, and I know this is probably um, favorable uh, molecular characteristics, the uh, cognitive outcome is um, not that bad. Um, there's a nice uh, overview of, um, of the Cochrane Library performed by of supervised by Robin Grant. And uh, this looked at all the studies that had been done into the, uh, the side effects of uh, radiation therapies, mainly in low grades. And the conclusion is that um, there are many biases um, and thus a low, very low certainty of evidence.
And it means that the risk of long-term deterioration in brain functioning associated with radiation therapy for the treatment of less aggressive gliomas remains uncertain. And having said that, um, there's a lot of um, development going on. So the, the first one I'd like to mention is the, is the treatment with, with protons. And protons, as we all know, have uh, um, favorable characteristics. Uh, so the, there's a relatively low entrance dose compared to, uh, to uh, photons. Uh, protons, um, they have a maximum dose at depth and a, a rapid distal fall off. So, so that means that the likelihood of, um, of um, damaging a healthy brain tissue is, uh, is rather low. It's not a, a new treatment. Actually, I found this picture. It's 1954. It was the first patient treated with protons at uh, Berkeley. And, and I'm not sure whether that was a brain tumor patient. I, I guess not. Um, a few studies have been uh, performed, mainly in uh, small samples, uh, understandably. This study published in 2016, 20 low-grade glioma patients evaluated at baseline and yearly intervals for up to five years. And uh, overall, uh, as we can see here, there's a, um, a stable cognitive performance over time. And um, the authors themselves, they say, well, we need longer follow-up and we need larger samples in order to be able to be able to figure out which patients might still be um, prone develop, to develop cognitive def deficits and uh, which patients uh, are not. Uh, this is another study, um, a follow-up study. Um, so they started with 20 patients, uh, six out of the 20 patients died. And uh, overall, again, they did not find uh, an overall neurocognitive de decline, but when you looked at the subjective ratings of patients themselves, so that might be uh, related to mood or cognitive uh, functioning, uh, patients with um, reported cognitive sym symptoms, they performed worse. And um, we can see the, the, the gray ones are the ones, uh, the patients with cog cognitive um, complaints, and the, the dark gray bars are the patients without cognitive decays. So, Complaints might differentiate between um, cognitive outcome. Um, final study, uh, 62 patients with uh, brain tumors um, assessed at baseline every three, three months by the MOCA. Um, MOCA is, um, I think, a better alternative than uh, the MMSE, but, but still we have, might, you might have doubts about the uh, sensitivity of the MOCA to pick up uh, minor changes. But, what they found was that in patients who are recurrence-free, um, cognitive functioning, as far as the MOCA is concerned, is uh, relatively uh, stable. A new um, um, means of uh, applying uh, uh, radiation therapy is with the ultra-high dose, uh, or also called uh, flash radi radiotherapy. You need a proton facility to um, to um, use a flash therapy, and here's the one, one here's one one of them in the Netherlands, and it looks like um, this proton facility is also a great uh, venue to to socialize. So, with the uh, next wave um, coming out for us, we might have some uh, nice time in the hospital. Um, the idea of of the uh, flash is that that we provide high doses, so more than two quay in a very short time, in more in seconds than in minutes. And uh, the, uh, the, the mechanisms of the reduced toxicity has to be elucidated. But the idea is that um, the high dose in the short term uh, gives acu acute oxygen depletion in irradiated tissue. And that renders healthy tissue to be radiation, radio resistant. And um, at the same time, this enables uh, dose escalation to levels that destroy tumor tissue. So what you achieve is uh, tumor control or, or um, tumor control, but without uh, the side effects. And if you're a mouse, there's uh, good news, and that's, that's with a lot of research in um, in this field that uh, animal models might be uh, very um, very promising. And here we here we have uh, m mice that are, are in a um, so-called uh, object rec recognition. So there's the training phase, so they get two cubes. And there's a delay, and then, then there's the testing phase, and they want to, to see if the rat understands there's a new object in space. And here are um, 
um, the outcomes and baseline. And, and what's important is to, to realize not, not as much as the specific task, but it's important to realize that um, controls perform at this level. These are mice who get um, conventional radiation therapy, and these are mice who get um, flash radiation therapy. And what you see is that they actually did not um, uh, suffer from any uh, cognitive loss. The same is, is seen in some other um, outcomes. So this is baseline. And at six months follow-up, so, so concerning the late, um, late radiation therapy effects, we uh, can also compare the healthy controls to the, to the uh, mice who had the flash, flash radiotherapy on several outcome measures. And what we actually, actually see is that um, they perform around the same levels as, as, um, as healthy controls, whereas uh, patients or mice, not patients, who had uh, conventional radio, radiotherapy um, had lower performance. Uh, something about uh, chemotherapy, um, there will be a discussion later on, um, realize that chemotherapy in brain tumor patients is usually after, um, after treatment, so these patients are not treatment uh, naive, and depending on the kind of um, agent we are using for to treat uh, brain tumor patients, there might be uh, agents passing the blood-brain barrier or uh, via, via peripheral uh, pathways. And, um, these are all um, factors that might, might um, be associated with uh, poor nor uh, neurocognitive outcome, but the precise mechanisms will be uh, elucidated uh, later on. Um, it also, um, when we talk about uh, chemotherapy-induced cognitive impairment, this is a real nice um, uh, picture of, uh, of review of, of this year. So there might be direct effects, impaired neurogenesis, white matter abnormalities, as we've seen in um, radiation therapy uh, patients already, oxidative stress, uh, immune dysregulation, vascular changes, uh, long-term potentiation changes, hormonal changes, and importantly, also uh, cancer-induced cognitive impairment, and which means that um, compromise of the, of the brain itself, so the effects of the tumor might um, contribute to cognitive deficits. Um, this is a nice study in low grades. Um, patients were, were randomized between um, radiation therapy or um, radiation therapy plus PCV, which is a combination of, uh, of chemotherapeutic agents. They looked at the MMZ score at baseline one, two, three, and five years, and they looked at uh, change over time, and change was defined as a, a change in the um, three MMSE points. And from this uh, quite busy slide, um, you can see, you can see uh, three columns. So that's observation, radiotherapy alone, or the combined arm with uh, PCV uh, combined. At year one, um, there was no decline in the observation arm, uh, some decline in the um, uh, radiation arm and the combined arm, but mainly patients stayed, uh, stayed stable. And this was the same in year three, year four, and year five. And uh, this means that, that if you uh, use the MMC scores, that might not be indicative of changes, but usually we tend to, um, to use a more extensive cognitive battery. And uh, Jeff showed some, some real nice work that MMC scores might not sh show any, any change of times, whereas his battery might do so. Um, as we all know, um, the addition of PCV uh, or temozolomide to radiation therapy uh, prolongs survival. So this was a, a, a milestone in the history of neuro-oncology and it's still a milestone because um, other treatments for uh, GBM patients are still, um, still not that um, promising. Um, mainly studies in, um, in PCV or, or in, the, in, the, in patients with where there's two protocols, so by looking at memory and attentional recovery, um, also look at the longitudinal, um, longitudinal changes. Um, and this study looked at um, also whether patients with um, the stoop regimen performed better or worse after, uh, after treatment. And uh, these are variable numbers, so uh, some really small uh, patients, small numbers like 20 patients and other much bigger, 
uh, using the MOCA, MMZ, and also compre comprehensive testing, but there's mostly no significant uh, change um, regardless on how those patients were functioning because uh, patients who start with uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy might have impaired cognitive uh, functioning already. There's no evidence that the com combined uh, treatment of the, of the STOOP regime um, negatively affects uh, these patients. Um, Bevacizumab has been a, an interesting uh, treatment, but uh, unfortunately, uh, survival is, is not uh, what we wish for it, it would be. And um, uh, the interesting studies show that uh, prolonged treatment of Bevacizumab might be associated with brain atrophy. Really small study, uh, seven GBM patients on the prostate cancer symptoms and prostate oligo. Um, so it's quite a bold statement, um, but there's an indication there. Um, and interestingly, uh, there's a mice study again that showed that uh, anti-VEGF uh, antibodies, so uh, bevacizumab, might mitigate the development of radiation necrosis. So which is interesting that drugs that um, did not prove to, to prolong survival, get a sort of second chance, but at much lower lower doses as a, as a means to um, treat radiation necrosis. So the conclusion, um, as we can, as, as there can be a conclusion, is that brain tumor patients are confronted with limitation in functioning throughout the disease course, as, as has been shown by uh, UK already. Uh, most studies are really small, uh, whether it might be uh, pre and post operative, but also st studies into um, effects of, uh, of radiation therapy or chemotherapy. Um, the reasons for cognitive deficits are poorly understood, and, and this is more so true when you go further in the disease trajectory. And uh, what we need are large studies with relevant outcomes urgently, urgently needed. So, not only looking at overall survival of cognitive, uh, cognitive function, but also mm -hmm. outcome measures that are relevant to, uh, to patients. Thank you. Thanks very, very much for this really important talk. And again, I think we underestimate what the treatment effects uh, are in terms of functioning cognitive assessment and the ability to rehabilitate a patient. I think you, you and Hugh have shown us how critically uh, important it is to consider these issues. And I tell you, the more and more I see things at my stage in my career, the more and more I realize that radiotherapy can be a very dangerous adjunct to patients with low-grade gliomas, and we ought to do everything possible to hold off on that therapy. I have one quick question for you from the audience. How do you balance the longitudinal cognitive effects we see in our patients with the normal aspects of aging. So is, is aging a major confounding factor or is it a minor factor? Can you answer that in a few minutes? I, I, I think in the, uh, the, my microphone works. Yeah, I think in the, uh, in the low grade glioma patients, in the beginning it, was, it wasn't such a big issue because we, we start around um, 40 years old. But when you look at the 26 year follow up, uh, some patients might be uh, in their 60s or 70s even. And um, mm -hmm. clinically, we, we always look at when patients have complaints about the cognitive function, we lo always look at potential other um, neuropathological uh, processes that might be at, at stake. So uh, dementia, uh, early, early stage dementia, um, mm -hmm. Uh, uncontrolled uh, diabetes, for instance. Uh, so it's, it's when patients get all the comorbidity, it becomes an issue. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, Martin, thanks again for taking the time to join us in this important inaugural seminar, and we look forward to having you back in the future.